what struck me the very first time that I met Aaron Schwartz was how, how childlike and gentle he was. You could see his mind almost like flickering at a higher rate than the rest of the people in the room. But you also got the sense that this young man, and he was very, very young, couldn't hurt a fly. And the idea that this kid ended up dead, uh, it, I, I just, I still can't believe it's real. I mean, I, I think the, the tragedy of what happened to Aaron is, is something that this film really helps bring home to the world in a way that just reading about the case can't. Yeah, actually that was one of the motivations. Um, you know, I, I started this film uh, about a week after Aaron died, I was on a panel with Quinn uh, talking about hackers and hacktivism. And, and I think everybody on the panel and everybody in the, in the audience, um, first of all, seemed to know him and seemed to have a, a kind of personal story about him, um, but was, was really struggling with that. And, and there, were, there were some things written about him early, um, but it seemed to be a very sort of small little uh, parts of his story. So I, I, I could see um, in talking with the people that knew him and were close to him, that there was a big sort of epic kind of a story of a complex, uh, prescient person that, that, that needed to be told. I mean, part of what's so beautiful to me about the film is that it feels like um, a home movie yeah. in some respect. I mean, I, I, you used so much footage from his yeah, family. Yeah, we were lucky. Yeah, his family. I, you know, you, often when you're making a documentary film, you, you, know, you ask your subjects, well, do you, have any old, you know, do you have any old pictures or do you have any old video? And, and so I asked Aaron's mom that, and he said, you know, uh, I'll look, and then came out with an entire box of, <laughs> of, of Aaron from, you know, for about 10 years. Mm. So, um, what was the biggest was surprise, the, the, the biggest uh, unexpected reveal for you in the making of this film? You know, I, I was, I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time reading Aaron's blog. He was a very, you know, he had written quite a bit. And, um, and just, just looking at this, this incredible amount of work that he had done, I guess that was one of the big surprises. Just, you know, there's a part in the film where we actually list all the organizations that he was associated with. Or just keeps going company. on and on, and on. I mean, I'm not even <laughs> meant to read that, really. I right. just kind of want to show the quantity of that. Yeah. So that was surprising. Um, yeah, I think that was just the, the number of things that he, um, he sort of lent his talents to. And in a way, the film uh, is a mystery. It's a mystery that we'll never be able to solve. The mystery of what Aaron planned to do with the information that he was snarfing down from JSTOR in that broom closet. It, it really is a mystery. And I think, um, you know, uh, it was something that was, that was at central to the kind of legal nightmare that he was going through. Um, you know, he did download 4.7 million academic journal articles. Um, and I think when you try to ask the question, well, what was he going to do with those things? There's really only three choices. Um, he could have, uh, number one, he could have tried to sell them. Uh, that was clearly what the prosecutors thought, that there was some kind of monetary value. That's, that doesn't sort of pass the laugh test to anybody else uh, who watched, uh, who was watching this case. Um, number two, he could have been posting them online, um, you know, like he did with PACER, uh, the PACER documents. But PACER documents were clearly um, in the public domain. Uh, there was uncontroversially in the public domain. Um, and he didn't post them online. He never did that. Um, the third option is that he was he was conducting some sort of um, analysis of them, looking at them um, d a, as a kind of base for research, and um, and, and there's I, precedent for that in his life. In that's the, what he'd done. Yeah, in the Westlaw documents, um, and that's so that's the conclusion that I came to um, in making the film. That that's and I talked to enough people that were close to him. What I think he was doing with that was he was he was downloading those to look for corruption in research. Um, that led to biased results in, in research, uh, particularly in the area of climate change. What happened to the prosecutors in this case? Have we heard anything from them since this film was made? We have not heard. Well, there was a, there was a, a very, short, very brief um, press conference um, in which a couple of questions were asked. Other than that, we haven't heard anything from them, and they're still in the same positions that they were in before. Uh, and I, I wonder, is... Like, what has become of Aaron's legacy and what has become of the outrage around his death? I remember that so vividly. Yeah. Um, and the sense that somebody should be held accountable 
for this surreal, Kafkaesque, yeah. and incredibly unjust um, bullying of this beautiful yeah. young man. Yeah, I mean, I think you see you see people carrying on the tradition. Um, you know, Demand Progress is still working. You know, EFF. There's lots of people that are sort of picking up where he left off. Um, so you see a lot of that anger. And of course, you know, there's a real, very poignant. Um, I think I pointed out to you when we were watching the the um, when he's talking about uh, surveillance, mass surveillance. Um, you know, he was that clip that we found of his is a year before Snowden comes forward. Almost to the date. Almost to the date. And he's before talking the, about Snowden released the. Yeah. yeah. And he's actually saying, well, why aren't people more angry about this? And that, it, that there's never been a kind of moment uh, that galvanized people. And he, the truth is, he just didn't live to see that moment. You know, you, you could summarize the story like uh, there, are, there are libraries where there are these gatekeeper trolls who are trying to charge people 10 cents at a time yeah. uh, just, just to access these documents. Or, and, and Aaron comes in and says, uh, this should be free, this information should be free. Yeah. That, that notion that uh, the great, our, our great legacy of knowledge should be freely available to anyone on Earth, that's that's kind of what the World Wide Web is built around. It, it, like yeah. The fact that Tim, yeah. Tim Berners-Lee and others, the architects of the internet, uh, championed this guy's spirit should, should really say something. Yeah, I think that, you know, in making this film, one, one of the things that I thought was one of the most poignant kind of insights that Aaron had is the notion of access to information as, um, as a class issue. Right, as a democracy kind of issue, you know, because there's a way of looking at this story where you say, you know, I get it, but there's real problems in the world. After all, there's, you know, there's climate change, this human caused climate chaos that's upending the planet. There's uh, this fact that we've kind of given our government over to the plutocrats, Larry Lessig's kind of battle. Um, you know, there's the, uh, the notion of a crim broken criminal justice system, you know, this kind of ma epidemic of mass incarceration. Um, so you might look at that and say, well, okay, so why should I care that the 1860 Journal of Botany is behind a paywall? And I think the thing that Aaron seemed to really understand about information is that when you give access to knowledge and science and research only to people with money, if you give the ability to participate in our government only to people with money, then what you're doing is you're, you're basically solidifying, you're cementing a stratified class structure. You're saying to people who are already struggling to participate, you can't even know how the world works. Uh, you can't even part, you know, know how your government works. And I think that that's, um, that's a particularly poignant thing that he, he seemed to understand that as a democracy, you know, these things, this, this ability to learn from the great minds that came before, uh, to build on information, that, that ability to understand and participate in your own government, these are democratizing influences. This is how a culture that thinks of itself as a democracy um, climbs, itself, climbs back from a slippery slope of uh, massive inequality. And uh, my colleague, Cory Doctorow, my co-editor on Boing Boing uh, in the film, talks about uh, Jack Andreka, I don't know if I'm yeah. pronouncing his name right, but this yeah, young yeah. man who was uh, 14 at the time who uh, came up with this interesting method of testing for pancreatic yeah. cancer. Uh, Jack's story is a, is a great example of open science. There's this whole movement of uh, open science, uh, hacking, yeah. biology, biohacking. Yeah. Uh, all of this relies on the great scientific tradition of sharing your Results. Yeah, I mean, as if we needed a sort of exclamation point on the kinds of things that Aaron was fighting for uh, when he was alive. Um, you know, two weeks after his d death, here comes Jack Andronka. And, you know, an early detection test for pancreatic cancer is exactly what that community needs. It's a very, very deadly cancer. And fi a five year survival rate, I think, is only 5%. So um, he comes up with the first thing. And, th and what he says is, I wouldn't have been able to do this if I didn't have access to JSTOR. He had a, a way to get at that database for free and just kind of root through it and do his own experiments. So um, as if we needed another reason why it was important. It's a, a beautiful film. Thank you so much, all of you. And a big you. hand for Brian Thank and for the rest much. of Thank the you. people who made this Thanks film possible. Yeah.